Peter, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Um, I am an absolute huge fan of, of yours and um, I really hold you in very high esteem. Um, I have really, truly enjoyed uh, taking your equestrian masterclass um, and have been using it um, in my personal riding. And so I'm really excited to talk to you today a lot about um, the forward seat and different types of riding styles and also um, a little bit about you and about how you um, think about the sport today, how you coach the riders that you coach, um, because a lot of that does come into the conversation in terms of style as well. Let's start here. Uh, we have all probably, if you're listening to this podcast, heard the term the forward seat. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes we hear the term hunt seat. Sometimes we hear the American forward style of riding. What do what constitutes the forward seat, and what about the forward seat is different than other styles of riding? So I, I guess you go back to the um, you know the 1900s when the forward seat sort of was coined, and it was a way to ride and to teach people to ride to be with the movement of the horse. So rather than being behind in front upright your your body was slightly elevated up out of the tack slightly forward going with the motion of the horse and i would say that it was sort of applicable to a galloping horse or a horse going very forward and moving very forward and that sort of positive forward riding that americans sort of became known for um, in the 60s 70s 80s i'm guessing i'm not a total history buff but that's what I understand is, is that that sort of forward, slightly inclined light seat riding um, was very known for American riding. And uh, that's, that was sort of the direction that our riding went at that time. And part of that was due to the fact that we rode a lot of thoroughbreds and uh, a thoroughbred sort of required a very light passive ride that was not sort of... Um, uh, sort of it the more you could sort of flow with the thoroughbred the the better that horse performed and the alternative the other side to that was the old what we think of old-fashioned german riding which was more longer reins behind the vertical holding the horse together with a lot of pressure um, and that actually was designed basically because they rode a lot heavier horses than we did that needed sort of that structure, that control. Um, and I would say that as the sport has uh, progressed and gotten modern, uh, the breeds of horses have blended. Um, European horses are much lighter now than they used to be. They have a lot more blood. Um, and Americans have steered away from American thoroughbreds and ride now these hotter European horses. And what's interesting about that is, is that not only has the, the, the horses sort of met in the middle, the riding styles of modern show jumping now has met, met in the middle. And I would say that um, there is a value to the, the um, forward seat in that it was a good way to teach, it, it is a good way to teach people to ride, but the sport has almost gone past it a little bit, I would say, in that you now, you almost become vulnerable in that sort of half seat position when you're trying to ride a big track or a big course. And in the equitation world, we often see what we term as a perched rider that sort of arching their back, the hand is locked on the neck, and they're in this sort of forward seat. So there's a lot of positive to the forward seat, but I would say that the sport now has evolved almost past it to an even more sophisticated position of basically sitting in the middle of the horse and being quite tall with the body. And there's a lot more dressage and collection into higher level show jumping. Um, that uh, the forward seat isn't actually the appropriate position for, you know, when you need that collection, when you need that sort of suppleness and roundness in the body, um, 
uh, of the horse, the, the rider actually changes its position and gets taller and brings the horse more together and doesn't ride quite as light and forward as we, we were sort of at this, the second half of the 20th century. So I guess that's a little bit sort of history. And um, again, there's, 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 a, a, there's something very positive about the lightness of the forward seat riding the sort of the, the mm-hmm. fluidity with the horse. Um, but sometimes the riding has to become actually more sophisticated than the, that one general position. That and was... and actually, we'll, I'll go into that when we talk a little mm-hmm. bit more about, about specific riders. Um, mm-hmm. You know, riders adjust their ride and their style to the horse that they're riding. Um, and so different riders have different variations of incorporating some forward seat riding to uh, a, mu- a much more upright uh, sort of dressage, if you will, position, uh, even though the leg is much shorter stirrup. But um, but there's a there's some real sort of nuances to modern day riding, which is it's a little bit more sophisticated than what we would call the forward seat. One of the things that you touched on there that I thought was really interesting um, because it immediately came to my mind as someone who has um, competed in hunters and equitation, um, actually, uh, even in college, you know, I wrote on the um, in the IHSA and on the collegiate team, uh, mm-hmm. we were quizzed on the American forward style of riding in the in the forward seat. Um, and it's it's sort of was in the beginning um, conversations around kind of what you're saying, like how much is, is too much um, when you watch some hunters ride and it's, it's supposed to be uh, my assessment and this might be incorrect. You tell me if it is, but uh, my assessment is hunter riding is supposed to be uh, um, in line with that American forward seat. It's supposed to uh, be a showcase of it. Um, some of it is so dramatized that it looks um, a little bit unnatural and a little bit shocking, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But some of that hunter riding, you know, if we're thinking back to where the origins of hunter riding came from, those horses were also um, galloping across the country and jumping out of mm-hmm. stride and maybe had a mm-hmm. different style of jumping. You know, the, the show hunters that we see today are just incredibly scopy and they have this amazing bascule. And um, if you look at a lot of, you know, old um, photos of uh, fox hunting riders, you know, going across country, like those those thoroughbreds jumped quite flat. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, I would uh, imagine that also the course design and the types of jumps that these horses are jumping over probably has a lot to do with how um, that really forward style of riding has also, you know, the rider has to sit up a little bit more to accommodate mm-hmm. that much scope and that much bascule. And also the fact that you're not jumping a jump and then cantering for, you know, a couple of minutes after that. You're usually jumping right. and immediately turning to the next thing. Right. I mean, the the international hunter derbies, the whole concept of hunter derbies, which has exploded in the United States, mm-hmm. you know, that's also made uh, for a lot of people, hunter, hunter, you know, competing a show hunter really interesting to watch these hunter derbies because the jumps are quite big. The courses are challenging. Uh, there's a lot of scope involved. Um, and one would argue that, yes, riding a hunter, in my opinion, is almost the closest to forward seat riding still mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. we have. Um, I would say that even in the equitation ring, riders are starting to get a little taller in their position. Absolutely. But hunter riding, you know, you want to see that sort of fluid forward moving ride. Um, but the point of hunter riding is actually to be quite still and for everything to to look seamless. So mm-hmm. the best hunter riders in 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 our country um, actually are beautifully smooth riders that have really good position and and the stillness in their body allows the horse to jump as well as possible. It's not stiff stillness; it's supple stillness. Um, and it's I kind of it's sort of I find the the hunter derbies are actually super exciting to watch because it really judges the quality of a of a horse. And if you watch like derby finals, for example there are some unbelievable jumpers that you just are really impressed with as a horse person, you know, even though I'm more of a jumper person, um, 
to to see these hunters jump the good ones and they really jump well and it and that's quite impressive to see but that style of riding that's as close to forward riding as i would say that we you know we have um the 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 higher level show jumping it's evolved a little bit to a more of an upright position um for the for the um for the biggest sport you know for top 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 uh show jumping and do you think that um the you know, uh, it wasn't very easy um, 100 years ago or wasn't possible uh, to have so much back and forth, whether it's the horses or the riders between Europe and the United States. And, you know, horses and riders are just traveling globally um, on a weekly, if, you know, if not daily basis, pretty much anymore. And um, so there's much more um, crossover between, you know, European riders and American riders. Um, or North American riders even just being in the same place. Do you think that that drove some of that um, blending together of sort of more of the European style of riding and then the American style of riding? I, I think that definitely had a lot to do with it. Um, I know for myself, when I had a chance, uh, the first thing that I did was get myself over to Europe because at mm. the time, you know, sort of the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, the Europeans were actually dominating the sport and we had sort of fallen behind because we hadn't actually adapted this more sophisticated way of riding. And um, uh, the sport had gotten so, you know, even more difficult and more sophisticated with the World Cup final and all of these indoor shows that we would we would do and all of the different venues that we would go to the quality of the horses, the quality of the riding got better. And so everybody needed to sort of hone their skills and get their riding better than what it was before. And that took sophistication. And a lot of us from America started to go over to Europe and hang out there. And they, I think in the same way they took from us, you know, there was a real, there was a real mix I mean, and you watch a lot of the best French riders in the world, for example, you know, Julien Epeillard is right at the top and Simone de Lestre. These riders are ride actually very similar to what, you know, classic American riding is, was, is, is they ride very light. You know, Patrice de Laveau, another fantastic um, uh, show jumping rider from France. They all ride it with incredible style, incredibly light. Of course, Michel Robert being the, you know, really the unbelievable light French rider. That's very light and very, you know, soft riding that um, is sort of timeless. Um, and we, you know, we have that also. Beezy, for example, you know, she rides in a classic American style um, uh, that's adapted her style. It's not sort of a perched forward position. She's an incredibly, ha you know, had. She's not quite at the top of the sport like she was when I, when I was in the sport, um, she was really everything. And, and, you know, she had such a classic position and, and a flexible position, you know, she could sink into the tack mm -hmm. and, 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 and ride with a very tall position. And then she could get light when she needed to. Um, and so that kind of modern riding sort of, I think the Europeans took from us and we took from them and we, we sort of saw the strengths in each other. And that, that comes from, I mean, I know from my, uh, perspective when I spent time in the practice areas with the best European riders, Ludger Bierbaum and Marcus Enning and, and Rodrigo Pessoa, you know, they were all in Europe competing, Otto Becker, Jos Lansing, and to just watch them and absorb from their skill and see what that they do works for me and how can I apply it to my own riding and try to you know, make my riding even better. And so when you talk about, you know, riding becoming a global sport, you know, obviously also Clip My Horse and YouTube and all of these videos being readily available to anyone to watch, um, people see really top riding much easier than we used to back in the 80s and the 90s when you'd hear the results, but you would never see the performances. Uh, and now everybody watches everything and can see everything. And so if you look, you know, for this podcast, you, you asked me about um, 
influential riders that I, you mm -hmm. know, and so I, I went to the world ranking list and I looked at the top 60 on the world ranking list. And there's really 40 of the top 60 are really classically beautiful riders that have a very similar style of riding. And that's interesting, you know, like um, to me, riders have seen that they have to perfect their riding. They have to perfect their style. They have to train their horses. And it's all very similar from country to country to country. You know, there used to be, you know, this country was this way. This country was this way. The Americans were this way. And now it's all because everybody realizes how important it is to be a really classically good rider, because that's what actually allows the horse to go as good as possible, as well as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, so you see that, and it's it's no coincidence that that they're all riding very, very, very much the same. And and rough or sort of unconventional riding um, almost doesn't have a place at the top of the sport in in our sport, anyways, which is interesting. Let's but you but 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 we also what we also I see that in in the eventing world as well. You know, mm. like the best eventing riders are just really good, beautiful riders like Tim Price and, and M Mikael Young, you know, these oh, are, yeah. and Boyd yeah. and Boyd Martin, you know, these are beautifully stylish riders that ride really, really, really well. They're very sophisticated. Their flat work is sophisticated. And so I, I think all of that comes from the sophistication of the sport, the quality of the horses, you know, horse breeding has gotten better. The, the, mm. the, the availability of top level horses is um, much greater. Uh, and so everything starts to sort of get, you know, to, you know, where everyone's trying to achieve the same quality and, and aspire to the same style of riding, which is, you know, it's interesting. It's nice to watch. Let's talk about some of those riders um, that you notice that are that are, um, as you say, you know, kind of classically correct and all and all pretty similar. Um, I know you have some thoughts on just riders that you really, really love to watch their style of riding. Um, talk to me about what you like, who those riders are and what you like about some of them. OK, so um, the person that I use the most is Daniel Deusser, and I find his not that I actually know his story, but from observing his story, I find it to be incredibly interesting because when he started as a young ride, young guy, uh, he was quite young. He went to work for Franky Slutak, who was a very, very, very famous German rider himself. Um, and uh, Franky always rode with a longer, very typical old German style, um, very tall, long reins behind the vertical. Mm -hmm. And when Daniel started to ride for him, he rode exactly like Frankie, like okay. it was it was so similar. You could immediately knew that he he worked for Frankie Slutak, like you could see it right away. And when he left Frankie, he was hired by Jan Tops and he went to Jan Stable in Holland. And all of a sudden he changed his riding style and it became modern and sophisticated. And now it's, in my opinion, the 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 riding that I would encourage anyone to try to emulate because his flat work is phenomenal. Like he can work a horse on the flat so beautifully and get a horse so rideable and supple. And then his riding over fences can be light. It can be forward. It can be supportive. It can be strong if it needs to be. He sort of has all this sort of um, ability to ride in, in such a sophisticated way. And his results, of course, you know, are, you know, are, are proof in the pudding. Yeah. But I like the story of Daniel going from old fashioned German riding, which was ab about as late that that riding existed. Daniel Deusser as a young, guy, young rider, um, that was sort of the end of old fashioned mm -hmm. German riding. And he and himself modernized and and it shows his skill level, his body control, his sophistication, his intelligence towards riding and, and his understanding. So he's a favorite of mine to for people to, you know, I encourage people to watch everything that he does with a horse because it's really, really skillfully and classically done. Um, and then, of course, Daniel is actually very tall and very thin. I was going to um, say he's also very tall. So that's not going to be as a um, biomechanical standard for everyone who's listening. So I always encourage all of my students to 
pick a rider whose whose body is a similar type to mm. yourself and try to think of that rider and how that rider rides and how that could work for you. And so the next person that I would talk about is Marcus Enning, who mm. basically as a, you know, even as a young guy, he was a stunning, beautifully soft rider. And he's another person that gets his horses really beautiful to ride on the flat. And he also can go from a very supportive, you know, tall, good base position to an incredibly light position. You know, he can ride the hottest horses and he can ride the coldest and slow horses. And there's nothing more impressive than his jump off this year at Aachen. Um, The round that he rode to win the Grand Prix of Aachen was one of the most artful and beautiful rounds you could ever possibly watch. So I encourage anyone and everyone to, you know, study and watch his round because that was, that was just so skillful and sophisticated. And the way that he rode into the double, which was a vertical oxer combination and just allowed the horse to clear the A element and clear the B element and his body position and control. It was classic. It was perfect. So that he's another one that I, I love his riding. I think he's a very thoughtful rider very skilled, um, very sophisticated. Um, and then staying on the rider of short stature, this to me is another interesting story, uh, is Meredith Michaels Bierbaum, who doesn't ride professionally anymore, but there is plenty of video archives to watch of her riding. And what's interesting about Meredith is, is that she almost went a little bit the other spectrum. She started and grew up in George Morris's sort Mm -hmm. of positive forward seat, light riding. She rode hunters, she rode equitation. She did very well in all those divisions. And then she moved to Europe and, um, uh, you know, basically became a German and started riding, you know, living here. And, um, well, actually she, she married a German, was still an American and then eventually changed her, her citizenship, but her riding sort of evolved from that light George Morris forward seat to a a much more upright, almost German type of riding on a very hot thoroughbred horse, Shutterfly. And um, that was sort of an interesting thing to see how she put her position right in the center of the horse. She had a little bit longer reins which actually allowed the horse to use its top line and jump in a really round form because she is short herself and she, you know, she can't possibly have a very short rein with her hand quite far up the neck because that would inhibit actually the horse's jump. So she's really an actually an interesting person to to study to see how she and her husband sort of worked together to form this style that she rode in that actually became world number one and one of the most successful riders in the last, you know, 30 or 40 years um, with Shutterfly and with Checkmate. And interestingly enough, those two horses competed until their late teens, both of them. Um, And she had them as seven-year-olds. Like she Mm. she competed those horses for 10, 11 years. um, And they were absolutely winning until the very end. You know, that was an impressive, impressive span. Um, And she's really an interesting you know, interesting story to, to, to learn about and to read about. And then the final writer that, I mean, I, I always talk about, I always talk about BZ being um, such a stylish classic writer. You know, she's, she's a wonderful writer to watch and she trains her horses so well. And they're usually, uh, you know, beautifully supple to ride and, and she can skillfully ride around. She can make win jump offs, not looking like she's winning the jump off. And I Mm. love that about her riding. You know, she, she was someone that could be as fast or faster than anyone. And it it didn't look like she was going fast. It didn't ever look like it was like a skin of the teeth situation. Right. Like, I mean, she's, that's her, that's her skill as a rider. And, and the fact that I I talk a little bit about that in my, in my masterclass of, Mm -hmm. of quiet riding is I love the quote, you know, I like riding that you don't see. And she's that kind of a person like she her. She has great balance, a great eye, 
has the ability to go fast without the horse ever really realizing that he's going fast. You know what I mean? She does it yeah. so well and in, in, in such a sophisticated way. So um, there, uh, there are some examples of riders that I really appreciate and really like and, and admire what they did in their careers as riders. Um, and another top, another top, I mean, there's so many on the top 60 of the world ranking list right now that I admire and am impressed with how good they are. But another one that I really like is Harry Smolders from the Netherlands. He's, he's, he's a kind of rider that can ride super light and be very sort of like a, a, a light feather on the back of a horse and he can ride a hot horse and he can also ride a very heavy cold horse. Um, that's an incredibly skillful rider and a rider that I love to watch. I love his, his sophistication in his riding and his style of riding. He's really a, he's a, he's a great, um, a great rider. He's really super talented. That's a really, um, what, what I like about, about that list is that it gives lots of different sizes Definitely. and body types, um, yeah. something to look at, you know, Meredith Michaels Beerbaum, um, you know, when you meet her in, in person, you're like, wow, you're just like the, a very petite tiny. human being like, yeah. She, yeah, she's tiny. Um, and it's, it's shocking to, because, you know, she, she looks petite on a horse too, but you can tell that she is so she's riding in a position that is so in, able to influence her horses in a positive yeah. way. Like she makes every ounce of herself count on those horses. Yes. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. That's very um, true. One of the things that, that is I'm wondering about, um, and I don't know if there's really an answer to this, but you know, also the, the way that we started talking about the American forward seat and um, how that sort of adapted and, I'm wondering how much the horse's contact and frame and way of going and even the, the bits that are available to us influence um, riders to be able to ride in different ways. You know, a question that's coming up in my mind is, has flat work advanced so much that the contact that the horse is going in is very different? And that has influenced the way that um, riders are, you know, not just planting their hands on the neck and sort of leaning up the neck. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I would say that ties into a little bit what I was talking about, how, yes, definitely the flat work has become much more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. um, I do feel like riders, different riders have different um, sort of uh, wishes some riders really like to have a frame and have control mm -hmm. other riders like the horse's head to be up and out in front of them um that's a that's a, a personal thing Preference. and i know that's mm -hmm. also very horse specific okay. like some horses actually need to be ridden in a in a shape and some horses can't be ridden in a in a closed shape and need to have their head up that's a little bit the confirmation of the horse and the temperament of the horse um, and I think you, you'll see um, very smart, sophisticated riders will tailor their riding to the specific horse. Um, and I think that that's really interesting. Having said that, that's a that, that's a gray statement because uh, oftentimes a rider can make a lot of horses look quite similar in their way of going and that's just because of the the skill of that rider so but i i would say that the really really high level riders um are able to adapt their style slightly to accommodate the best way for that horse to go and that's and that comes from really sophistication you know like the the control of the horse's uh, from even when I was, you know, starting Grand Prix jumping in the nineties, you know, the control of, and the, and the ability to do all of these very sophisticated lines has got much more advanced than it was, uh, you know, sort of 50 years ago, 40 years ago. Yeah. When we, when we talk about riding styles, um, as, as we, we've sort of done been doing for the past few minutes you know we're, we're talking a lot about position but I'm wondering if in your mind when you think about riding style um, is it position that makes up a riding style is it how riders ride the course is it you know even like sometimes uh, when we were talking about BZ riders bringing different energy to the way that they ride BZ never looks like she's just 
um, like trying to get it done, like trying to make it happen. Like it always looks like she's well composed and within herself. How do you think about defining like a writer's style overall? Is it all of those things? Is it none of those things? I, I actually kind of love that question because to to me, writing is such an expression of the person's personality and self mm-hmm. um, in that, you know, uh, when you talk about BZ, BZ is a very sort of focused, she's not a yeller. She's not someone that, you know, is, is, is making a big scene all the time. She's very cool thoughtful. She's very, mm-hmm. very focused, very cool as ice. And that's a little bit the way that her writing is. Um, and I, I feel like, uh, you know, a writing, a writer's personality is very reflective of the way that person actually handles horses, works with horses, and in turn rides horses. And um, sort of the, the 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 polish or the the sophistication or the thought of some riders is very different depending on 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 what their what their character is. And I, I find it to be very interesting. And I mean, you can go from rider to rider to rider, and it usually is uh, is um, uh, sort of very reflective of what kind of what what their character is. You you also have to add into the fact that um, riders that are are less experienced. I I always found this interesting was um, you oftentimes will find very successful people in business or in in whatever professionally that they do that are not riders that want to start riding. And they didn't quite appreciate how sophisticated and how difficult riding is. And they're used to being successful at what they do. And they're not able to actually be successful at riding. And that's infuriating to them. It's a very uncomfortable feeling. Um, And I've known and witnessed people who, who are actually very sort of intelligent, very successful people in in business but aren't able to actually be successful in riding and it frustrates them unbelievably so and on the other hand they may very well enjoy riding and love riding it's an interesting reflection when you're adding in the skill factor some people just aren't skillful at riding but their personality then takes over what they're doing with the horse and that's that's sort of interesting as well but definitely riding styles is a reflection of a, a rider's personality there's no question do you think that confidence the rider's confidence whether it's that's in their own position or their own ability or confidence even in their horse affects their riding position and style and the reason i'm going to ask you this question is because as you know i come from an eventing background we were taught if you ever are a little concerned about what your horse is going to do next, get the hell behind them. Um, right. And that's a very defensive position. I think that there's probably difference in a defensive position than um, what you were describing kind of the old European style was. But mm-hmm. do you find that the rider's confidence ever um, influences their position um, or their riding style, their confidence, you know, even in their horse? No, no question. I mean, confidence is such a major part of riding because riding is so mental as well as it being, you know, that riding is, is an incredibly sophisticated sport. You know, you have your, your balance and your position and your skill level, but then you also have the, 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 the mind control to keep your nerves calm so that you don't translate it to the horse, that you sit quiet so that you don't make the horse nervous or tense or stiff, that your eye works for a distance. You know, that's a whole mystery to so many people about having a quote unquote good eye. For some people, it just comes naturally. For other people, it's a nightmare seeing a distance and seeing a distance is such an important part of show jumping for sure, you know, hunter, right, you know, all, all of what we do, um, it, it, it's a major part of your riding ability is to have a good, quote unquote, good eye. And so that confidence, confidence in your eye in itself is a big thing. You know, if you have confidence in your eye, your eye works better. If you doubt your eye, your eye doesn't work as well. And so confidence for so many different reasons affects affects 
what you're doing on the back of a horse and your own, you know, if your own body becomes tense or stiff. Um, and then, of course, what you were talking about, uh, getting into a defensive driving position, going into, quote unquote, panic mode when you're getting to a combination or whatever and you're not feeling like the horse is not there for you. You know, you're you immediately change and you start riding stronger or harder than you need to. And that's actually something that it's funny that you say that in, in my experience in the event community is when event riders see a long distance, um, oftentimes they scream at the horse figuratively to move up to the dis dis distance because that's their instinct riding cross country. Whereas have done that. Yep. We, we, <laughs> what I try to work on them is to just whisper to the horse that the distance is long because usually event horses are going plenty forward, you know, that they don't need to scream that it's a long distance. They just need to quietly whisper to the horse and say, this one's a little long. And then usually it works out much better, but um, that comes from a panic, you know, sort of a panic mode. And as you get more confident in your riding, your riding, it, your brain works calmer and your, and your all, everything that you do becomes calmer and more, uh, clear to the horse, you know, it's not nearly as, as sort of, um, loud. <laughs> mm. I laugh because I have, I, I, that feeling that is creeping into my body because I've felt that a number of times it's the, it's the, oh shit moment. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, we, we, we all, everyone, you know, all of us have those moments where, you know, you, the, you, you're not loving the way things are working out mm -hmm. and you overreact and that, yeah. you know, that sort of, whether it's lack of lack of confidence or, you know, whatever, that's the hardest part about riding is to be able to stay calm and to ride as, you know, efficiently and proficiently as possible. It's interesting. It's an interesting part of our sport. I want to talk, I, I want to touch briefly on course design and course mm -hmm. building and how mm -hmm. you think that is influencing um, rider styles, you know, back to show jumping today uh, mm -hmm. The courses are so technical. Some of the courses mm -hmm. are just, I mean, first of all, course designing seems like such an art, um, mm -hmm. such depth of understanding of what challenges a horse and what challenges mm -hmm. a rider. Mm -hmm. um, I just, a well-designed course is just absolutely mind boggling to me. I'll never understand how um, it's, how it's done so well, but uh, you know, we also have the, 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 mm, I don't want to say pressure, but we have the interest in making this an accessible sport to spectators. And so mm -hmm. um, there's got to be some excitement and, mm -hmm. um, you know, that drives good sport in, in a lot of ways. And um, mm -hmm. so how, how does course design come into this conversation and how, what are some of the biggest ways that you've seen course design change um, from the time that you were really competing a lot? now to mm -hmm. your time really coaching elite riders? Uh, so I first to say that sophisticated course design is, is an art form and it's an incredibly difficult skill. And there are, you know, there, there's a reason why there's a handful of the really best course designers in the world that are used regularly because they are so good. And also because they, they actually, quote unquote, read the room um, they know the horses that are going to be in the class. They've seen these horses, they've seen these riders, and they know how hard they need to make it. That's that's how sophisticated they are. You know, they they are they are on tour. They're building at a lot of the big shows, and they're very aware of who they're building for at the highest levels. And the what what's changed not so much since i stopped doing it because it hasn't been that long but what's changed since the 80s for example or the early 90s is the delicateness of high level courses and that's in large part because of the quality of horses and the sophistication of the riding um the horses are so good now and the riding is so good now that they actually have to make it that hard. Otherwise, they have too many clear rounds. And it has to be that delicate. You know, the, the, we, they just have a lot heavier pulls. Like even in Calgary was one of the last shows to sort of, um, you know, refine their, their heavy pulls. Um, 
you know, an Aachen for a long time had heavy, heavy poles. And now Aachen is very delicate, very light poles um, on very flat cups, very careful. You know, instead of seeing six or eight poles on the front rail of an oxer and one on the back, you know, you've got three poles on the front rail of an oxer or a vertical is just three poles. You know, it's so light and delicate and careful, but that's because it has to be, you know, the quality of the riding is so good and the quality of the horses is so good that that's the only way that they can get a manageable amount of, of horses in the jump off and not have 15 or 20 in, in every jump off. Um, and that's sort of that's sort of the evolvement of the sport and the quality of the sport. But course designing is is um, is yes, you're presenting a show, and I think most course designers at this stage know how to make a very exciting jump off to watch. Mm-hmm. You know, they try to get around eight to ten horses in the jump off six to 10 horses and they try to make it that there's a few sort of there's maybe an inside turn option that somebody might dare to do um, and there's a long run maybe to the last jump that's very dramatic you know that kind of thing course designers they're fully aware of that and aware of of not making it a, a steeplechase run in a jump off they want to see some sophistication and some turns and some do you do one less? Do you do one more? Do you go inside or around? Or how tight can the person turn? You know, that's a that's a skill of a really good course designer that um, can make make a good jump off, for example, that the audience can really react to and understand and see like, oh, wow, he just went inside to that oxer off of the turn. That was really tight to do that, but he was able to do it. You know, those kinds of those kinds of things. And that's, that's where a really good course designer, it makes a big difference in the sport. Absolutely. Is there a particular designer that when you know they're designing the course, you get excited? Uh, there's a few. I mean, uh, Uliano, who designed the European Championships in Milan recently, I find him to be a really good course designer. Alan Wade is a really good course designer. Mm-hmm. For years, Frank Rothenberger was a, you know, was, was, you know, sort of the, the top European course designer, all of those course designers, I think are really skillful, but there's many, many, many more, you know, I've, I've been out of that level of show jumping for a while now, and there's a lot of new good course designers that are coming up um, that are starting to get used at big events. And, and that's really exciting. Um, and from different parts of the world too, you know, uh, of yeah. course, Le- mm-hmm. Leopoldo is from Venezuela and, you know, he, he, but there's Brazilian course designers, there's, there's, course designers coming from Spain, you know, that are, that are really, really sophisticated and, and good. And when someone has that feel, you know, and it takes a real feel course designing, it can be learned, but I think, you know, you sort of said earlier in the question, uh, that it's the nuances of a sophisticated course designer that really has a sense of what makes horses jump well, actually, mm-hmm. and what, what actually isn't good for good riding. Mm. Um, and I find that to be also very a, a very thoughtful part of course designing, um, and also for different levels. You know, like like there's a courses you can design courses for young horses that will actually make get horses jumping better, and you can design you know badly designed courses actually make sort of rough riding. You know, you're sort of forced to do uh, pull too hard or yeah. fit one, you know, do this or that, that actually is counterproductive to young horses jumping well. So there, there's on, on all different levels, there's, um, uh, uh, you know, a sophisticated, serious sophistication to course designing also for amateurs, you know, like the lower level divisions, which we see a lot of in America, you know, one, one 10 classes, even one meter classes, where you have a safety factor, you know, you actually don't want these people to be running too fast because they will and they'll hurt themselves. You know, you, you, you don't almost ever want to make a, a fast straight line to a two stride combination because of the fear that the horse might leave in one and tip up. So there's, there's a lot of different, different factors to course designing on all different levels that, um, that's a that's a very sophisticated skill that that um, fortunately we have a lot of good ones, especially at the top of the sport, that are are really smart, intelligent, good course designers. 
Yeah, it's the uh, misconception that it's not just about making it hard and seeing how many people you can right. work out. A lot of the time, it's actually about Absolutely. to jump really well. Agreed, um, yeah. One of the things we've touched on a little bit, um, a couple of times in a small way in this conversation is um, that you have ex- that you've you've shifted your career quite a bit, um, and so I want to talk about that a little bit and what it's been like for you moving into focusing. You're still riding, um, but focusing more on coaching um, and also coaching eventing riders, which I think is really interesting. Um, just. From a personal level, though, I'm very curious how this has landed for you, um, just in terms of um, personal fulfillment. And has it felt like when you when you began doing it, has it felt like what you expected it to? Um, it feels like what I had hoped it would, I guess. Great. Um, mm-hmm. So to work with the eventers, um, I've really, really enjoyed this. Um, I got asked by Eric Devander and Boyd Martin to start to work with Boyd a little bit and see how that went. Um, And I really liked it. First of all, Boyd is a fantastic person. I mean, he is, he's probably, you know, one of my favorite people that I've ever worked with and helped. He's Mm -hmm. professional. He's super uber talented. Um, He loves horses. He loves what he does. Um, He's punctual he's you know everything that you want boyd to do uh he does and also as a as a rider to work with if you suggest something to boyd he does it he can do it he's capable of doing it Mm. uh he's skillful and that's actually the part of what i've if i've you know what i've changed in my life is you know to working with these eventers and i work with a small group of i have about eight event riders that I work with and they're all exceptionally talented riders and that's fun and they're all professionals themselves Um, and so I'm just uh, a little bit of gravy on the top you know I'm not the meat and potatoes of their their business they're their business Um, but I come in as a consultant and just work on the high level sophistications of their show jumping um, and sometimes that ties into their cross country riding and their dressage riding. Like I'm a horse person and I see things. And so if I see something that I think might help them, I make suggestions. I'm often quoted as saying, this isn't really my thing, but what if you tried this for, mm-hmm. you know, this in dressage and they, you know, usually it, it lands on receptive ears. Um, they sure. don't necessarily always take the advice, but I like to offer it because it's what I see. Um, and again, I've, I've sort of, I feel like I'm a horse person and I see things in the dressage ring and in the cross country, you know, part of eventing that um, I think can be helpful. So I'm, I'm oftentimes offering it to them, but working with my eventers, the, the eventers that I work with, I've really enjoyed. It's really fun. They're a very enthusiastic group. They love their horses, um, and uh, they're incredibly hardworking, dedicated professionals, all of them. Um, and so that's sort of been a really fun change in what I'm doing. And, you know, I made a conscientious choice about five years ago to really slow down my riding myself and to not um, sort of try to be at the top of the sport, which I was for a very long time. Uh, or a high level of the sport um, and feel very proud about the results that I had. Um, I felt like it was, I felt like I wasn't riding the way that I had ridden in the past. And I, I felt like my time as being the best that I could be had passed. And it was time for me to now share as much as I could, the knowledge that I had, the experience that I had and my insight into show jumping or show jumping for eventers to share that with other people and to work with other people. And so I'm also lucky that I I'm working with two hunter jumper young riders right now as well. And that's actually just by choice. Um, one is Skylar Wireman from California and one is uh, Nora Peters from Rhode Island. Um, Skylar's 18 and she's sort of a, had a huge junior career, but now as a professional and wanting to do everything that there is in the sport. And so I work with her and her mom. And then Nora is the granddaughter of my 
riding instructors when I was a child. And That's awesome. so she's sort of family to me. And um, so I helped Nora and her mom, Annie Doddley. Um, I worked together with the two of them on Nora's riding. And Nora has a, a very nice equitation horse and a jumper. And she rides a hunter that I own that I've given to her to ride. And um, so that's actually a lot of fun with me because the, the hunter that I own is is a, a homebred. I bred him myself. And oh, I, I didn't know that. Yeah, wow. his he I bred him. I I own his mom still actually. You've and, had some and, really good results with that horse. Yeah, he's a very very fancy hunter, and Nora is a beautiful. Even though she's fourteen, she is a beautiful rider, and they're a great combination together. So that's actually been a lot of fun. Like I've loved being with the Dodleys and watching my homebred hunter go with their granddaughter, really cool. and it's yeah. really it's been fantastic. So and she's fourteen and he's nine, so we have many more. You know, we have four more years as her being a junior with that horse, which. I, I think it's just only going to just keep getting better and better. So that's been very exciting. But my main focus in my main time right now has been going to, you know, basically all of the biggest events in the world. Um, I went to the world championships. I went to the Olympics. I've been to Burley and badminton and uh, Lemulin and Aachen and Fair Hill and Lexington. And now I'm going to go for the first time to Poe in the South of France with Boyd at the end of October. Um, and so that I will have done all of the five stars except for Adelaide and Australia. Um, and we've won one of them. So that was kind of fun. Boyd has gotten four, I think, top four or five, six top 10 finishes and five stars since I've been working with him. So that's actually been really fun. Liz also has gotten a couple, three, four top 10 Liz holiday. Um, the other you know, event rider, top event rider that I work with. She's gotten a lot of five-star results as well. She was fourth at Lemulin last year, and she was third at Lexington this year. So it's actually been really, really, really fun. And those events are impressive to be at. I went to Burley this summer, and Burley is just an amazing event. What a facility. What a place that is. I mean, it's stunning. Um, so that was really exciting to go to Burley and to, and to see that. And, of course, badminton also is incredible and it's been fun. It's been really fun. I'm curious, you know, you've been to all these top show jumping shows, um, competitions, all of these top uh, three day event competitions. What feels different, even just amongst the riders? What does the environment and, and the culture sort of feel? How do the, they, those environments feel different between disciplines? The, the eventing world is a much more down to earth world than the show jumping world. I mean, the show jumping world has become an incredibly elite uh, sport. Not that and I don't want to I don't want people to think that it's only for the uber wealthy, um, because the best riders in the world are all hardworking professionals. Mm -hmm. um, but if you just look at the, the, the venues and the locations of the biggest uh, show jumping shows in the world, versus you know even even burley which is arguably the best five star in the world you know the stabling is in a field at burley and it's it's there's a lot of wearing your wellies and traipsing through mud and across hill and dale and everything like that and it's a it's a much more it has a much more sort of like country feeling to it whereas Oftentimes when you go to show jumping shows, there's a lot of people in high heels and hats and it's much more glamorous and fancy. Um, again, I want to be clear that that doesn't mean that the show jumping riders don't work equally as hard and train and have hardships like uh, all of the other, you know, in, in that sense, the, the, the work ethic, there's a lot of similarities to what what these people do. And, and um, you know, somebody like Boyd Martin and Liz Holiday, you know, they've been in this sport for a long time. They now have superb support behind them that they can take beautiful care of their horses and their horses get massaged and acupuncture and chiropractor and treadmills and I ice therapy. I would love to be one and, of yeah, I mean, horses like, on these, her boy's horses. These, <laughs> these horses are all treated and that's very similar in the show jumping world. I mean, it's, it's in, in that sense, there's a lot of similarities and we talk about a lot. I mean, again, I have knowledge of, of maintaining, 
you know, Olympic caliber horses and producing them to that level, you know, the highest level. And there's a lot of similarities in the, the care and the feeding and the health of the horses. And so I can work with my people uh, about that kind of stuff as well. But um, I would say that the, the, the eventers are a lot more laid back than the, than the laid back in that they're, they're, they're a little bit more sort of country casual than the, the show jumpers are. Cool. Um, you know, one of the things that, uh, that strikes me about the way that you're coaching now, um, you know, and, and a lot of people who are listening, this might, um, they might not think about what it's like to coach really elite athletes. You know, the majority of riders are not at that kind of skill level. What is the nuance of coaching riders who all are already so good at what they do? Um, they have so much of a skill base. They have so much knowledge already. A lot of them have their own way of doing things already mm -hmm. to a certain extent. And so mm -hmm. um, I guess where do you um, feel that you can come in and like really offer the most value to them while also I don't know if there's like a, a bit of respecting kind of what they've already built and not wanting to like totally reshake things for them in a way that's really disruptive or scary or, you know, anything like that. Um, what, what does that look like? What do those communications look like? And, um, how, how does your coaching come into play into their programs? So, it, um, I've always been, um, uh, as a trainer with virtually all of my students, I, I like to say that this is a, a, a democracy, not a dictatorship. In my teaching and so oftentimes much. oftentimes I will say to them let's have a board of directors meeting and discuss um, mm. but I do that with I've always done that with most of my students no matter what their skill level is um, I try to talk to people as intelligently as I can and explain things as well as I can giving them the credit that they even though Phys, you know, skill level wise, they might not be able to do what they want to do. They can certainly rationalize and think about it. Um, when you're talking about working with uber talented people like Boyd and Liz and, and Skylar and even Nora, who's 14, but she's incredibly talented. That's what I find as a teacher super interesting because we're talking about really the sophisticated parts of top level riding the nuances, you know, the really subtle subtleties that aren't obvious um, and to give them exercises that they can do that's going to help get their horses to jump better and to watch them ride and then say, what if you were to try this? And I think you were, it was really interesting what you said about not trying to dominate or to uh, change the way they do things because they're already super talented and super successful and they've gotten to where they are for reasons mm -hmm. um, that I never want to, you know, riding is such a personal thing that I, I never want to sort of say, say to any of them, you must do it this way. Sometimes I will. Sometimes I feel like I need to step in and say, I need you to do this this way. You have to do this. But mm -hmm. that's rare that I'll do that. And most of the time now that Boyd and Liz, for example, and Skylar and Nora have spent enough time together, they uh, were, I think they respect me enough that if they sense that I'm being a little bit like a dictator in something, they accept it and they, they're like, yeah. yes we'll take it you know like but i'm if he's very, being this firm about something it means he really reason. yeah exactly yeah. and 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 it's very rare that i do that but there are times that i do that but in general i want to try to work with that person's way of doing things and then just again add a little bit of gravy on top you no know, mm -hmm. it's it's they, it's their program they're the meat and the potatoes of this program and um and so i just i'm only just adding a, a little bit on top of it um and again a lot of it is conversation um you know you'll see there boyd has done a couple videos of me schooling him once was at great meadow and once was at weck in in ocala and you can see how we have these conversations and have this sort of um, talk about the real subtleties of how to ride a course. 
And I think that's what's that's what my eventers, um, all of them, they really appreciate that because it's it's a it's a level of of sophistication that they really they they understand it, you know, they get it and they can do it, which is really fun. You know, they're really talented writers. So that's been a lot of fun. This might be a total oversimplification, but j- just the I'm thinking of sort of the the stack of things that we learn as writers, you know, as we become better and better um, and and develop more skill. And, you know, initially when we first go to a riding school or we first are taking lessons, we're learning to post the trot and we're learning our, our canter leads and everything like that. We're really focused on our aids. Mm-hmm. as riders it's it's mm-hmm. focused on you and your position and how you're putting your where you're putting your leg and where all the buttons are and how to hold the reins and it's it's completely focused on you and then at some point you know you become skilled enough that it becomes focused on you and your horse um, and right. then maybe as you progress on um, it becomes mo- a little bit more about how you can be a trainer to your mm-hmm. horse. So really mm-hmm. more understanding the horse that's underneath of you. And and then maybe you continue on. And then, then you have to take into consideration, um, if you're competing, uh, what challenges that particular show pose for you and your horse. So that's like mm-hmm. another layer on the cake. And it seems like you're up at kind of the top layer um, of this cake where it's it's not these big um, macro adjustments. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I doubt that you're uh, frequently saying, you know, to Boyd, like, uh, I don't know, um, we need to completely overhaul your um, your leg position or your galloping mm-hmm. position. Put your heels down. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, put your heels down. You're on the wrong lead, Boyd. Come on, right. dude. Um, but it's more those details of what's the environment there that we are in what particular challenges is this horse going mm-hmm. to find um because i i would assume that you're also learning about all of these horses that are Ab- in absolutely these strings. sure and i and that's part of why i like to and try to spend as much time with them and i ride them all like i've ridden all of boyd's horses and all of liz's what? horses i've i've jumped them all that is myself so cool and that is awesome. I, I, I do that for two reasons. One, because I want to feel the horse and feel what he's feeling or she's feel or Liz is feeling. But also sometimes I feel like I can show them with my own riding rather than telling them. And they, I, I, I'm saying that because they've said that to me. They've said, wow, it helps so much to see you do that. And then they can, it, it, it's almost like a clearer way than me sort of expressing it. Although I try to be as clear as I can when I say things, sometimes it doesn't, it's the, the, the subtleties are hard to explain. And then when they see it and they see me doing it, um, it's, it's interesting and helpful for them. So, um, but definitely, you know, what you were talking about, I mean, in, in the master class, we talk a lot about the concept and I've always taught this to no matter who I'm, teaching is that you you should be conscious and aware of what you're doing and how that affects the horse like i always feel like it's important to be thinking about your horse as you're riding and incorporating that um um, but with with boyd and you know with higher level riders um it's all about you know like we're working together to make the horse go as well as possible and if that means that he needs to hold his body a little taller off the ground and not lean too far forward off the ground, then that's part of the conversation. If that means that the horse's frame needs to be a little bit more closed or a little bit more open, the neck needs to be a little bit longer, then that's the conversation. And that just comes from me watching them, knowing the horse, knowing their riding and and picking out what are the most important things that we need to be focused on at this point in time. And also how to train the horses to jump the best that they can and be ready for a, a big level competition. Um, and those are sort of the, the, again, the, the sort of the intricacies of training top level horses and top level riders, which is the part that I really, really enjoy. Hmm. Okay. I have to ask, I'm, cause I'm so curious now. Um, is there a horse that you've ridden, uh, whether this is a show jumping horse or an Eck horse or a, an event horse, is there a horse that you've sat on that? shocked you in some way like it went differently than you were expecting or you were just like holy gravy this is an incredible horse 
Well, there's there's a lot of both of those. I mean, it's interesting how most of the time I have a pretty good sense of horses um, just by watching them. But like you oftentimes, know what they're yeah, going to feel like. Yeah, uh, yeah. I I did actually, interestingly enough, just to throw this out there, I did ride a horse um, this past week for one of my riders, and I was shocked how cold the horse was to the leg, and because hmm. it looked like it was a hot horse the way it was going around, and yet. It it had energy, but it was not reactive to the leg. And that sort of really taught me a lot about both the rider and the horse. Um, and of course, then you go to horses that you just sit on that you um, you just are, you know, oh, my God. And, you know, Boyd's horse, Luke, for example, is just an incredible animal. I mean, that horse is so talented and so, so much quality and uh Liz has she both Boyd and Liz have really really very good horses right now mm-hmm. so it's really fun to work with them because they have horses that you sit on and you know I think oh I could jump a big show jumping course with these horses they're scopy and careful and and beautiful to ride so um that's sort of always fun to get on horses and 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 feel them and that's part of the reason why I like to ride all of my, you know, basically I've ridden all of my students, all of their horses. Um, mm. So that's actually quite fun. Yeah. That's a cool day in the office. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so three little things. Um, what are three little things that each listener can do to become more quiet, stylish riders that they can like immediately apply to their riding after they finish listening to this podcast and they go to the barn today? Um, well, I talk about this in the masterclass. Number one is ride without stirrups. As much as we all hate to do it, um, it's so helpful. And it, it's helpful for your balance, but it's also helpful for your strength. You know, it really gets your strength, um, you know, your base secure and strong. And the more you can ride, you know, when I was a kid, my trainer, you know, when I was 11 years old, he would take my, he would come once a week to my house to give me a riding lesson on my pony. And he would take, take my stirrups with him when he left. And he said, I'll see you next week. (laughs) And he'd call my, call my parents and say, don't you dare buy him another pair of stirrups. I took them. So, I mean, you know, like like, throwing rocks at his headlights as he drives out your driveway. (laughs) So that, uh, that, you know, you just, you, you got to do it. And as painful as it is, you got to do it. So that's, that's probably number one. That helps. Um, Two other things that you can use that practice is put a stirrup leather around the neck, you know, sort of where the martingale goes, but a little bit farther because sometimes martingales can come back quite close to the saddle. And if you put a stirrup leather sort of in the middle of the neck and really think of keeping your hands, even you can partially hook your finger into the stirrup Mm -hmm. leather and ride like that for a little while, it really teaches your hands to be quiet. And you can even jump like that. And it keeps that your, your hands sort of more on the neck, more, you know, sort of not dependent on the mouth but more dependent on just being still. And I actually like that exercise a lot. That's a really good exercise to teach your hands to be as quiet as possible. And of course, the quieter your hands are, the quieter your body is. So that's another great thing. And then the final thing that I tell virtually all of my riders who have you know difficulty with their position over the jump and smoothness over the jump is, as you're arriving at the fence, raise your eye and look up. You know, people really look down a lot when they're riding. They're really put. And when the head goes down, the balance goes forward and everything falls apart. And you really have to practice keeping your eye level up and looking up. And especially when you arrive at the jump, if you raise your eye level off the ground as you're arriving at a jump, your balance is so much better in the air and on the landing. If you pick a point and look at it your balance is, it really helps your balance. So those would be my three things of what to do that you can, particularly the stirrup leather, you know, putting it around the neck and Mm -hmm. your eye level up. Those are quick fix things that can really help. Riding without stirrups is not such a quick fix thing, but is something that the more you do it, the, the better you will be. I promise you that. The other thing that I just have to add on to that is that um, because I had a a trainer who uh, really drilled into me, especially as the fences started getting a little bit bigger for me, um, 
she really drilled into me the the looking um, looking ahead and finding a point. I found that that really increased my confidence to jump bigger fences um, because I. Be, because when you are up and you're back, those fences do not feel as big as when your face is down in the fence. She would say, like, get your face out of the front rail, like <laughs> sit up and look up. Um, and so I found that that, can, that really helped my confidence as well. Yeah, it definitely helps. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, thank you so much. You oh, are you're so I just, welcome. I am so grateful for your time um, and for your brain. And um, I, I just, I hold you in such high esteem. And so it, this has been a, an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure also.